Welcome to the Rebellion, where the brews are kind of saucy. Thunder Junction calls. Let's round us up a posse. It only matters if it ladders. Comment below as we walk through the final recap of Karloff Manor Standard. Alrighty, gang. This is the final ranked tier list we'll be doing of Karlov Manor Standard. Next week, we'll be taking a break to prepare for Outlaws of Thunder Junction, but we'll be back on April 24th with your weekly State of the Meta once more. Now, the tier list, as you can see this week, features Demir Agro and Temer Ramp at the top with trusty Esper Midrange nipping at their heels. Boros Convoke still grabbing those trophies at smaller events, and the continued rise of Demir Controls, the big story today. Oh yeah, Tier 2 is where Domain ends the season, despite starting strong, due in no small part to the continued existence of Demir Aggro, combined with a top dog Temer coming for it. Joining it are your three favorite mainstays in the form of Mono Red Aggro, Bant Toxic, and Azorius Control. Stay tuned as we update these lists with Thunder Junction options. And last but not least, now that the spoiler is out, we'll be throwing showing Thunder Junction Brews using Moxfield, highlighting Mono Black Control, Boros Midrange, Blue Skies, and Green Stompy. Rebels, as you know, we've partnered with TOA Magic on our State of the Meta series. For those of you who aren't already using TOA Magic for your paper tournament needs, click the link below in the description, head on over to their site after the video, and check out the store. While you're there, don't forget to use the code REBELLION for 5% off at checkout. As always, TOA Magic can deliver all your cards in one package with free track shipping on every order and over 1 million fulfilled orders to date. We're all about dependability here at the Rebellion, and we can confirm that TOA gets it done right. Oh yeah, now on to our Tier 1 Archetype Breakdown, starting with Demir Aggro. Alright, gang. Venom 1 took down a 57-player MTGO challenge on Saturday, piloting Demir Aggro. Nine pilots made top 8s with this archetype, and two trophies went home with Demir, keeping it at the top of the heap for another week. Now, let's get into where this archetype might evolve with Thunder Junction. From where I'm standing, the following cards are kind of up for debate, and you're going to see them pop up here. Now, first of all, Tiny Bones the Pickpocket, it might be a thing. We're a deck that likes to get under people, we're a deck that likes to have engines. Tiny Bones is an engine unto itself, as long as you can clear a path and enjoy killing, then casting their cards. Similarly, you have Archmage's Newt and Caustic Bronco, both of which are still on that plan of let, let's clear a path and enjoy the card advantage. Uh, once you go up the curve a little bit, you get it to Kervek the Punisher. Now, if we go for repeated crime triggers via like a legendary creature plan, this works pretty well. And Tiny, Bone, Tiny Bones joins up will also help with that repeated crime triggers if you're playing hard with the legendary creatures. Last but not least, uh, Shoot the Sheriff is a card and is probably going to come in as at least a one of for diversification from Go for the Throat. Oh, yeah. All of these very cool cards, very cool new cards that want to get through a deal player, you know, some combat damage. I need to ask you though, is there any tech that, you know, may not be, you know, getting a lot of play that we can use to make sure they get in unblocked or is it really just a matter of packing a lot of low curve uh, targeted removal? I mean, Max, there's always going to be ways to put, you know, evasion onto a creature. The question is, is there anything that does that and something else in case you don't have a creature because you want the modality. And if there isn't that kind of modality, it's usually not worthwhile because you're too reliant on maintaining a creature and having that, right? So in, in my opinion, no, there really isn't. I'm gonna go for low curve removal if I'm gonna play that route. And honestly, I like where these creatures are positioned when we're playing against decks like Temer Ramp uh, or Domain, where they're not putting down early threats. So we have the ability to just dump it down and swing through like it's Ragavan, but for standard. You know what I mean? Absolutely, absolutely. All right, talk to us about the next deck in Tier 1, Esper Midrange. Mick Windsauce made it to the semifinals of Sunday's 74-player MTGO Challenge with Esper Midrange, making them one of 12 pilots to snag top 8 slots this past week, though only one trophy was had. However, let's turn to Thunder Junction and discuss which cards this archetype might consider. Now, first of all, I look at this and I think, Pest Control. First card to stand out is a new method of keeping Boros Convoke in check without wrecking your board state at all, which is a huge upgrade because right now we're running three temporary lockdowns. And when you do that, you're, you know, working on how do you deal with it? Do you lose the Denix? Do you lose the Bats? Do you have to stutter step them? It's an issue, but Pest Control makes that mostly a non-issue and only hits your wedding announcement tokens, virtual loyalty tokens, and wandering emperor tokens, all of which are going to be farther up the curve anyway. 
Now, rest in peace is also going to merit consideration with the rise of Temer Ramp and its reliance on the graveyard. And honestly, Aven Interrupter might replace Obscura Interceptors moving forward. Finally, again, we look at Shoot the Sheriff. We see that we might want one of those over a go for the throat for diversification. And last but not least, you have Duelist of the Mind, which reeks of potential when combined with Rafine triggers. We've uh, we've seen Shoot the Sheriff a couple times now already. Uh, is this going to come in over Go for the Throw the majority of the time with the upcoming standard meta changes? I don't think it's uh, coming in over it. It's kind of like the meta we had at one point in standard with Doomblade and Cast Down. And it wasn't a question yeah. of did you want one more than the other. It was that you wanted you know either a 2-2 split or a 3-1 split depending on what you expected to see from your opponents. And really, Shoot the Sheriff is going to be playable at a high level but it, it's unlikely to ever be a four of because people will just start running outlaws if that's a viable archetype in any way shape or form and then you have to flip back to go for the throat however one or two copies of shoot the sheriff gives you the ability to interact with some of those uh, simic cookies decks that really make go yeah. for the throat awkward you know what i mean yeah and uh, with the rumors that azorius artifacts or jeskai artifacts might be coming back as a thing i don't know that that could also add another reason to play more uh shoot the sheriff but yeah in any event let's uh move on talk about the next deck boros convoke coco f piloted boros convoke to the top eight of sunday's 74 player mtg challenge highlighting the deck's ability to perform higher than a local level contrary to last week's results that said on the local level the archetype did capture two trophies and elevate six other pilots to top eight so clearly it's doing something right on the rcq paper circuit lately however let's focus on the deck's future not the past we get into thunder junction there's a few different cards to consider now hellspur posse boss Army in a can, it's what Convoke likes to do. Unfortunately, it's almost certainly worse than Sanguine Evangelist. However, Haste might make up for it, depending on what you're trying to do against control <laughs> decks, etc. Stingerback Terror. The fact that this can get searched up with Knight Errant of Eos and plotted early to be an absolute nightmare with Emidane's Recruiter makes me think this card is about to get a starting position in the deck. Time will tell if it lives up to the hype, but the potential is absolutely there. High Noon. Another effective method to check Temer Ramp or slam the door shut after an explosive start against almost any list. Now, I don't think it's making the cut, but it is really intriguing that you could just explode onto the side, like onto the board, then slam a high noon on turn three and effectively just push right through them because they have to hit wrath effects or else they're wrecked. There's a couple other cards, but honestly, those are the ones that I think are most important. Yeah, that's fair. Uh, so we talked earlier about pest control. Uh, does that card singularly make this deck go up the curve just a little bit to avoid being hit so hard? I don't think that's really an option. I'm going to be honest with you. I, I think it's going to come down to a scenario where Boros Convoke likes to force the opponent to just have it. And forcing mm -hmm. your opponent to do that means that on average, unless people are overboarding, they're going to only see those sideboard cards one out of the two postboard games, right? So mm -hmm. typically that strategy works as long as you can win game one. The problem is if we see pest control in the main board of decks with regularity. If we see that, I don't know that I want to be playing Convoke, but at that point, uh, you know, most of the hyper aggro lists like Bant Toxic are also going to be cooked. So it's time to look at a different aggro list in general. Yeah, yeah. You raise a really good point worth considering. So uh, let's talk about Temer Ramp. So King Harry got the trophy in a 50-player MTGO challenge this past Saturday playing Temer Ramp, making them one of six pilots to snag a top eight over this past week and the only one to trophy, keeping Temer in tier one land to end the season. Now, looking ahead at Thunder Junction, there are a few cards to consider. The first one that comes to my mind, honestly, Bristly Bill, Spine Sower. Just put it as a one of to come in off the sideboard as an alt win condition in conjunction with these Falaji archaeologists, these aftermath analysts. Uh, it's the deck has so many landfall triggers, so many landfall triggers, and it generates enough mana to easily use that Bristly's activated ability multiple times in a turn. So if post board your opponents are losing all their removal, this is going to be a huge alt win con to push back against them. Now, speaking of alternative win conditions, Bonnie Powell, clear cutter. It's another path to victory. Between the giant token and Bonnie's passive ability allowing us to draw on ramp, I think we can justify a single copy coming off the sideboard at a minimum. 
Yeah, that card feels like it was tailor made for this deck, <laughs> actually. Right. And uh, I've also I've also seen a couple of other cards get mentions. I don't know if you've had a chance to see Owen Path's Journey and uh, Loot, the key to everything. Uh, what do you think of either of those cards? Do those make the cut? To me, loot is really slow, and that's a problem. Mm -hmm. Like, it's it's not moving fast enough for what I want to be doing. It's going to be dead to a lot of removal spells, potentially. It's it's just a little bit awkward is how I want to put it. You know, I, I just don't see that being the card. That said, maybe I'm missing something there. Uh, when we get over to Omen Path, that is intriguing. I, I think that may end up having a slot if we need to have sustained ramp in the face of graveyard hate. If we get to a place where we know the graveyard hate's coming, but we need to sustain ramp and not just try to trick it out with our two drop, um, I, I could see that. I could see that being the path that we want to be on. Wow, I I just think this deck, I, I'm glad this deck has some new cards, but honestly, I can't wait till it rotates out. <laughs> in this any is, event, let's talk about, go ahead. I mean, this is the case with most combo. Like week one, everybody loves it and everybody's fascinated with it. And by like week three, everybody's sick of it. It's just how it works yep. with good combo decks. <laughs> We've definitely reached that point. But uh, let's talk about the next deck in our tier one listing, Demir Control. Gracias Portanto got to the finals of Sunday's 74 player MTGO challenge, taking the latest archetype to rise to the top, Demir Control. Now, Demir finishes this season as a surprisingly potent contender, notching six top eights and a fresh trophy to set the foundation of what's to come. Now, having reviewed the spoiler, the future for this archetype is bright indeed. We, we gotta look at Kervek the Punisher and ask ourselves the question, is this better than Seed Shark? Because that's gonna be the litmus test for this card's ceiling in Demir Control. I don't have the answer, but I'm definitely intrigued to test it. Shoot the Sheriff, again, we're going to see this diversification with Long Goodbye, Shoot the Sheriff, Shel Shelly's Edict, Go for the Throat. Uh, the fact that we have that much diversity in removal is kind of nuts and is definitely damning <laughs> for the uh, aggro archetypes. A few other cards that are worth considering, Servant of the Stinger. I don't know if that's actually a reasonable path to stalling early and threatening a tutor as we go through the game, but it's possible and it could be really rough for Boros Convoke. Harvester of, Mis of Misery is also potentially correct, but the question is, will that actually be stronger than Gix's Command? And that's going to make or break that card. Yeah, that card does seem very interesting. I, I do like it. Um, what When you consider that Path of Peril actually rotates out later later in the year, do you think that would be the time for a card like Karavik or Harvester of Misery? And really, how much does the deck change without that card? I don't know that the deck changes much, to be honest with you, Max, because we have Malicious Eclipse anyway, and we obviously mm -hmm. have Harvester of Misery if we want it, but uh, I, I don't know that the deck's going to change a ton with Path of Peril rotating because there's so many Wrath effects in Standard. Like, I know people have been <laughs> in our comment section upset about it. <laughs> I get it. There's a ton of Wraths. You could literally build a deck with enough card, like 60 card Wrath. You can just build that if you want to. You could troll everybody with 60 Wraths. You could do it. Yeah. <laughs> it's probably been done right oh man but in any event hey that's it for tier one let's talk about some more changes coming uh starting with tier two's domain oh boy how the mighty have fallen <laughs> once this deck was considered a perennial powerhouse am i right now it's a clunky tier two ramp list with some fights still left in it uh, Semigo One managed to make it to the semifinals of Saturday's 50 player MTGO challenge on the back of Domain, making them one of five different pilots to manage a top eight with the Traxa and friends. So, the big question really what gems are hiding out in Thunder Junction for this archetype, especially with it playing all the colors? You'd think it's got a wide array of cards to choose from. First one that came to mind was Get Rog Ravenous Ride, a powerful five drop that has an impact right away, having haste and trample. Add that the saddle ability and domain can get to seven very quickly. Find attracts it even, uh, and, and and have it all happen more efficiently. Final showdown. Uh, let me just briefly give a mention to Spree. Spree cards are crazy. Spree's a hell of an ability, especially in mirror matches, Mexican standoff situations. Stop their Atraxa, save your Atraxa, or use this as another board wipe for the aggressive decks. I love these cards that scale so well in the set so far. Fair, fair. And there's plenty of different options to try out. I mean, Domain's five colors, so everybody who's looking yeah. to brew, I mean, have fun. There's gonna be you can literally try anything in the new set. There's gonna be a lot of options. 
My question, Max, getting more specific, will Domain play pest control off the sideboard for Convoke instead of temporary lockdown? Ooh, yes. <laughs> Absolutely, yes. Uh, I think that that card, not only because it shuts down what Convoke wants to do, its early game plan, uh, but it also, you know, Red catches some hate, but really Bant Toxic also catches some hate. So you have more reasons than just one to play pest control. I think that definitely is, is going to be in sideboards and Domain. Uh, definitely in the future. Fair, fair. And of course, you know, rest in peace exists, so Kutzel's flanker might go down a little bit to make room for that. I don't know. We'll see. But it's interesting yeah, as an option. Uh, but with that, we're going to move ahead. We're going to talk a little bit about Mono Red. So Mogged took down Sunday's 74 player MTGO challenge with Mono Red which, combined with another pilot making a top 8 appearance, was enough to really resurrect Mono Red to Tier 2 status as it finishes out the season. However, looking ahead, let's see how the archetype evolves with Thunder Junction. I have quite a few cards to mention. Cunning Coyote. Plotting is not bad, especially in red. It tends to be very low cost, so you think about casting, casting it out right on turn 2 is not bad. Uh, but I expect to see a lot more fast plays from Red where you're plotting this using Sif's Swift Spear, Monstrous Rage on turn 3 to give you 6 power, plus the 2 power from this 2-2 Haste body, possible 8 damage. Um, I, I think this boosts Mono Red. We've got Demonic Ruckus. Again, plot is low cost, well suited for Red. Red Aggro can really store up plays for a turn where a deck like Convoke or another you know aggressive deck swings out, and then the crackback from Red is a lot bigger than the opponent would imagine. Um, great train heist, great mana dump for the late game for red, provides a boost early if you do have a board state already, right? Plus one, plus zero, and first strike for three mana, great value, especially again in the other matchups with other aggro and mid-range creature based decks even. So the, the plot card I'm most intrigued by for red is Slick Shot Show Off, and honestly, in my mind, I'm imagining this beautiful turn where you've got like three of them plotted and you pop them down and play two play with fires and just annihilate a control opponent who's been sitting back on wraths. <laughs> but uh, like, do you, do you think Slick Shot actually makes the cut? I actually, uh, Athena talked about this card recently on the podcast, and I, I agree that I think it does, uh, especially in this deck uh, with what it's trying to do. But um, yeah, you also think about other archetypes that it fits in really well in. Uh, you you actually have an Is It Prowess deck. You have Gruul Aggro with Audacity, different things that it tries to do that could apply. So I don't know. Um, I think it actually fits in better with those archetypes. It's going to be competing pretty hard in that slot with some some of the new red cards. Fair, fair. And I'm I'm curious to see all the different brews because we know Slick Shot's going to get shoved into a lot of things and it's going to be tried out a lot. And for those who are still playing Wizards and Historic, you're welcome. You got it. Um, but <laughs> let's move on. Let's talk a little bit about Ban Toxic. All right, Arcany One pushed through to the finals of Saturday's 57-player MTGO Challenge with Bant Toxic, marking them one of three pilots to achieve top eights with the deck. Now, to see if the most toxic deck on the planet can devolve further with some help from Thunder Junction, let's take a look at three cards that I think might apply. Getaway Glamour. Uh, this could target Rot Priest, right? Save it from being removed. It has another great mode that destroys their big creature on the board so you can get through with your poison counters against their walls. Uh, Rustler Rampage. Untap to block. Target your own creature with Rot Priest. Uh, out or give a toxic creature double strike for even more po poison counters, uh, you know, Jawbone Duelist style. Um, also, Fleeting Reflection, again, more Rot Priest tomfoolery, duplicate a Rot Priest, protect a Rot Priest, you know, modality is key. Either way, this card is mean to opponents that are targeting your creatures. Fair, fair. And I, I look at this, Max, and I see all three of these options centered around combat tricks and abusing Rot Priest. Outside of that, does this archetype stand to gain anything else? And if not, will that limit its ability to compete as we move forward? You kind of read my mind. It doesn't really find anything else. And, and I hate to say that because I really looked in these three colors. Um, I do suspect that right certain cards like Pest Control, like we've already discussed how that's going to affect it greatly. Um, I think that card alone, plus some other hatred that, that the low-end aggro is going to catch, uh, makes this deck a little bit less viable. So we'll see, of course. Anything could happen, but I, I think its stock value goes down. Fair. And, I mean, 
when you don't get any new toys, what are you gonna do? That said, I, I do look at the new like lost jitty and part of me is like, maybe, mm. or is it just a shitty jitty? <laughs> I don't know if it's a shitty yeah. jitty, but probably. Either way, a deck that will not be uh, testing out jitty, Azorius Control. So Brennan Franks battled into the semifinals of Sunday's 24 player. $1,000 RCQ in Lake Charles, Louisiana, on the back of Zori's control, no less, becoming one of three pilots to make a top eight appearance in the past weekend with it. Thus, this archetype ends this Karloff Manor cycle in a near tailspin at the bottom rung of tier two, holding on, not by much. Uh, let's take a look at several new toys this archetype gets, though, and I'm going to try to run through these as quickly as I can. Archangel of Tithes, at least as a sideboard one of against hyper aggro it seems to put those decks in check even interrupter uh i wonder if anyone would actually be so bold as to play a full set of these uh especially depending on if the plot mechanic becomes widely used which you know will we'll yet to be seen bovine intervention it's okay removal we see this card in and you know we see other versions of this card in older formats it does give them a 2-2 body but if we're seeing our artifact heavy archetypes this might see some play emergent haunting this deck is known for holding up on turn two, so you can reward that with a 3-3 blocking body at the end. Dust Animus gets a mention, Final Showdown gets a mention, and Step Between Worlds. So, a lot of toys coming to Azorius Control. There are. Now, there's a piece we should discuss, though. All of these counter spells, right? Make Disappear, No More Lies, these two mana counters, they're based on the opponent not having enough mana, right? Will the plot mechanic ruin this? As, value, as viable counter spells for, you know, Azorius Control, for Esper Midrange, for Demir Aggro. Do we just lose the ability to play these counter spells? That's a, okay, so I have a two part answer. The first part is, I think it does make a dent in that, in that strategy. Um, it, it brings the stock value of those cards down. But second part is, how widely is the plot mechanic gonna see, see play and see use? Is it going to be sprinkled throughout different archetypes uh or is it going to be restricted to just a couple decks on the you know a couple of the top decks um that's going to weigh heavily on azorius control and its ability to counter the meta a wide sector of the meta early on my my prediction is uh at first it may stumble as we experiment week one with plot mechanics uh you know other mechanics in the set i think plot being probably going to be the most popular um but i think just like control decks tend to do and we've talked about before here uh will get better and pick up steam as the season goes on fair and with that we move on to brewer's corner this is my favorite segment every week and this week in particular we get to talk about thunder junction so let's go ahead and kick things off with a little mono black control now, everybody, I apologize ahead of time for the layout. We have to use Moxfield because this isn't on Arena till next week. Um, so credit here to Vixen Zavir of the MTGR Discord for sending us this list. I will try to move up and down so you guys can see all the cards. Uh, the key new cards here for Mono Black, you can obviously see the Shoot the Sheriffs are sitting there. Insatiable Avarice. I love that this card exists. I'm very curious if it's actually going to be good enough. I mean, late game, what a monster that you could get to tutor, draw cards. And also, the ability to just outright kill your opponent if they're at three life is not a small thing sometimes. Furthermore, getting Servant of the Stinger, Harvest of Misery. Like, we are trying out all the new cards right here, all the new toys. I love it. Servant of the Stinger seems like it could be wildly good in a deck like this, where you have the ability to just plop it down early and either it trades out nicely, keeps them, and stalls their board, or it starts trading favorably because they can't afford for you to get to tutor. Because what if you just tutor up the Deadly Cover-Ups? What if you're tutoring up Insatiable Avarice? Like, there are too many bombs with Aklazot's Harvester, Deadly, to just ignore Servant of the Stinger. So I, I really like what's being done here. Credit again, Vixen, Zavir, what a cool list. All about it. Yeah. Yeah, and we're seeing it play here just in those seven instants. And then the board wipes, too. Just the diversification of removal that Black is going to get to take advantage of in the upcoming yeah. set. So that that's exciting. Yeah. But uh, let's talk about a deck from Athena the Bun, Boris Midrange. All right, uh, not new to the deck, but just something I have to highlight is Heart Flame Duelist, and just how awesome it is to play that card in conjunction with you know damage spells, spe specifically Brotherhood's End in the sideboard. Um, but what does this deck get? Uh, it, you know, one of the new cards here is Bruce Tarl, Roving Rancher. Um, 
ox and you control have double strike and then the ability to just keep pumping out things and getting bigger and bigger board states that sounds very exciting especially when you combine it with the fact that you have Contorius Khan, which with the discover mechanic can bring that right into play uh and then trumpeting carnosaur above that we all know how great those cards are uh breaches is also in here not not a card that synergistically works with the deck but i mean breaches is a is a house unto himself so i i already like breaches it's just kind of like a good card for a red creature based uh strategy so we have all of that we have scorching shot uh, in addition to Lightning Helix here, Scorching Shot dealing 5 damage, so getting rid of quite a hefty amount of creatures uh, for your single targeted removal. So, I don't know. I, I like where this deck is positioned in the meta right now. Do you think Bruise Tarl is good enough? That's really my big question when I look at this. I, I'm i going to say the same thing that I'm going to say when I talk about uh, Mono Green later on. I think week one, we're going to have a lot of fun with this card. Uh, but right, the question is, is after week one, do people adjust? Uh, how much is this going to see play? I think in this specific archetype, yeah, I think it's, I think it's pretty good. I don't think you put it in like Boros Convoke or, or any low end aggro, but I think in a more mid range or a control style Boros, I think it's fine for now. Fair, fair. Now let's get along to the third brew here. Oh yeah. A little bit of blue skies. I pulled together this <laughs> particular one uh, really on the back of wanting so badly to just mess with Duelist of the Mind. The fact of the matter is Duelist of the Mind is perfectly positioned for Proft. That, I feel like that's what this card was made to do is go with Proft, especially when you consider that Flow of Knowledge plus Duelist of the Mind is insane. Like if you go Duelist, Proft, and you get to Flow of Knowledge, you should be winning. Like that, that's basically game <laughs> right there. That, that should be a minimum of 10 damage. Probably you're going to get closer to 14 to 16 damage right there from a flying vigilance creature. That's kind of nuts. I don't know. I, I love the idea of this deck. I have no idea if it's actually going to be viable. I know we've tried a lot of different versions of props. There's been Demir. There's been Azorius. Some people have tried. Is it? I think Duelist of the Mind is going to slot into all of those. And really the reason I wanted to highlight this is to let everybody know Duelist of the Mind is going to be in those prof lists. So if you are a Proft player, start putting it in now. Figure out how good it is. I think it's going to be excellent. It might be better in Demir where you can commit more crimes more easily. But <laughs> ah, I don't know. It's it's already pretty spicy. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I'm i excited about the Proft. I'm a Proft fan. I played both Demir and Azorius on stream. 50% win rates, but I still had a ton of fun playing them. <laughs> fair, fair. And that's going to bring us along to our final brew. Max, take it away. Little green stompy. Oh, boy. Y'all know me. Y'all know me. I'm always trying to bring back the big G. Mono green. Can Is it ever going to be viable in the standard again? Well, this deck is here to answer that question. Gold vein hydra. I took one look at that, and I said, let's, let's build something big around that. So vigilance trample haste on a single creature is already great value. Uh, but then when it dies, you dump a bunch of treasure tokens. So I thought, you know, green ramping, drawing cards, if it can do those two things, it's going to do really well. So we got one copy of Tribute to the World Tree with full set of Awaken the Woods. Uh, so when you play those, they, they come out as three threes. That's huge. That synchronizes really well with uh, Bristly Bill and the Landfall mechanic. Uh, you're going to be putting 1-1 one, one counters on a lot of things when you combine that also with uh, Defiler of Vigor in the five drop slot. So we got a little bit of synergy with the one one counters here. Colossal Rattleworm is brand new. Uh, we do have three deserts in here that you can search up uh, with the uh, new card, I'm trying to find it. Dance it? of the Tumbleweeds, Yeah, I believe is what it is. Yep, so a little bit of uh, synergy, a lot of new cards in this deck. I suggest you try it week one, if it can really run over the other aggros in mid-range or uh, if control is gonna be too much for it. We'll see, we'll see. So that's gonna bring us to our final segment, predictions for the upcoming week. Now, Max, we've looked at 13 archetypes tonight. What are your predictions going to week one of Outlaws of Thunder Junction Standard? Ooh, this is exciting. Based on what I've seen from this set so far, I predict we're going to see Colossal Shifts among the top decks. I'm just going to say that right now. Week 1 brings with it a few questions, of course. One of the big ones is, will Plot be a huge mechanic? Uh, many players are seeing this as a way around the tyranny of control decks. Counterspell certain counterspells have become popular in particular. How many decks will embrace the mechanic? Is it just going to be a few? Will players? Another question, will players try to squeeze the value out of Timur Ramp before it's gone at rotation this fall? 
or will the return of rest in peace completely eliminate the archetype uh mono red does get stronger aggro in general does gain pieces that try to force it to go up the curve just a slight bit uh boros convoke is seeing this as well as red how will these decks fare in light of the increased strength of decks like demir other aggressive mid-range lists this is why we do this week in week out tracking shifts in the meta this release of outlaws of thunder junction feels like a stampede of shifts are on the way you better saddle up brewers because we got to get this wagon trail moving <laughs> now how about it darth rictus where does the end of karloff manor era leave standard so i looked at the numbers last night the season ended with demir on top as per mid-range boros convoke Temer ramp and demir control are close behind it and as a macro meta picture though let's look at how everything shifted this season when we started boros convoke had just arrived on the scene followed swiftly by four color slow Gurk legends mono red and domain were still at the top and esper midrange was running rampant per usual with its pal demir aggro as the weeks passed we would see golgari midrange and azorius control both find their way into the spotlight for a moment or two but they never quite stuck the landing mono red fell off a cliff for a while as did bant toxic and people kept trying to make rakdos aggro happen and you can't make fetch happen it never quite took <laughs> now slogurk disappeared though it weirdly kept winning rcqs in iowa i have no idea why that aberration existed i just watched it happen then as we enter those final weeks of this season Temer Ramp rose to prominence followed closely by demir control and now as we look ahead to thunder junction we know who the established players are but with standard having the largest card pool i've ever seen there's plenty of room at the top my too soon prediction for this set is that there's an artifact based deck that is actually a contender for the tier list finally so join us in a few weeks when max and i recap week one of outlaw standard and big and we'll make our beginning of season bets on which archetype will claim the most top eights and which archetype will take down the most trophies yes i can't wait that's gonna be so exciting Thank you for your support watching this video to the end. I really want to give a special shout out to our members who have joined the rebellion already and support our content weekly. And if you'd like to support what we do, be sure to turn on all notifications, like, and subscribe, join us for our premieres. It's really the best way to let us know that you want to see more of our competitive content. So for those of you who can do a bit more though, feel free to check out our merch below. Join the rebellion. We're working on our subscription tiers, adding new incentives uh, as Thunder Junction comes out. We'll be announcing things, so pay attention for those announcements in the future. And until next time, Rebels, untap, upkeep, resist. Resist.